All right, with that, we will get started It's uh, as it's 1.30. Uh, thanks again, this is Eric Kauge, Executive Director of Homeline. And uh, thank you for joining us on our April 30th webinar regarding Minnesota landlord tenant law during the pandemic. Uh, our managing attorney, Mike Bra, will be presenting today for an hour. And, um, and uh, we'll be, we, we had a number of questions submitted in advance that we'll be getting to, uh, but again, uh, feel free to submit questions via the Q&A box or via the chat, or if you wanna raise your hand and you have a mic, we will call on folks to ask questions verbally. Um, again, last week uh, on Thursday, we did a general presentation and I will put the link to the recording in the chat and we'll send it out afterwards as well. But if you want to, if you have sort of general questions, we did cover a lot of that last week. So again, just a quick introduction, Homeline, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We provide free legal advice for renters throughout the state. Our main program is a free and confidential hotline that tenants can call. And we answer questions, um, direct legal questions that tenants have in four languages, English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong. Uh, our staff is made up of attorneys, advocates, organizers, and we rely a lot on uh, volunteers and interns. So we're gonna pretty much just get straight into the Q&A. And uh, again, feel free to submit questions via the Q&A uh, box, the chat, or raise your hand. And with that, I'll hand it over to Managing Attorney Mike Bra. Thanks, Eric. Uh, to start, I'm just going to give a quick recap of kind of the, <clears throat> the main couple of issues that uh, sort of dominate the COVID-19 landlord-tenant uh, landscape in Minnesota. Uh, the first is that uh, at present still, landlords are not allowed to file evictions for, uh, well, most of the things that they normally file evictions for. Uh, Non-payment of rent, which is well over 90% of all evictions in Minnesota, a landlord can't file an eviction under the governor's order, uh, which goes through uh, mid-May, May, May 13th, I want to say, and then the 14th would be when the landlord, I suppose, could file it. Maybe I have it the wrong day. It might be the 14th and then the 15th. But um, along with a federal law called the CARES Act, which probably affects somewhere between 25 to 50% of Minnesota landlords, uh, if there's any kind of federal subsidy involved, it would certainly uh, prohibit a non payment of rent eviction through not only July 25th, but then the landlord has to give a 30 day notice at that point too. Uh, but it also applies to landlords who have federally backed mortgages, um, which could be uh, a lot of different landlords. We've seen in a couple of states where evictions are uh, starting to gear up again, that landlords are being uh, asked to affirm that they are in fact not covered by the CARES Act when they file their eviction. Uh, is this is information that perhaps only the landlord could know and they've got to go to their mortgage company to get that information. But the, the clearer and easier rules to follow right now are the state prohibitions on evictions, which uh, except for a couple exceptions, if the, the tenant is seriously endangering others or if they violated the uh, statute that specifically calls out uh, illegal drugs, illegal guns, prostitution and stolen property in the household. Those are really the only exceptions where a landlord can file an eviction right now, today. Non-payment of rent, a landlord cannot file an eviction. That order from the governor is, as I mentioned, set to uh, expire in mid-May, but it can be extended. Uh, it has been extended once before by the governor already, uh, and we, we honestly don't know what the governor will do in mid-May, whether that will be extended or not. Um, I think it's, uh, probably more likely than not that it would be extended at this point, but that's based on a lot of rumors that we're hearing from a lot of different uh, directions. Ultimately, it's the governor's decision. The, the state legislature could stop the peacetime emergency, but both houses of, uh, the, both the House and the Senate would have to vote to end the peacetime emergency in order to uh, stop that from continuing on. Uh, we're at the end of the month. This is April, 30th, and I'm sure many of you have tenants that are moving out today, uh, which is perfectly legal. Uh, actually, in, in one of the governor's shelter-in-place orders, the first one, it wasn't especially clear 
if a tenant could vacate under the concept of should I have to stay in my uh, home if I've already given a notice to vacate and I want to move out as a tenant. Uh, but the subsequent shelter in place orders, the governor has been revising them. Uh, and I think that there's more revisions either happening today or uh, going into effects early next week. I'm not sure when. Um, do allow tenants to move from place to place if they wish to. Uh, it's when the landlord is trying to either evict or terminate a tenancy that the landlord runs into uh, the, the moratorium on evictions and terminating the tenancy. But that's really the main couple of rules that I wanted to sort of start with. I know we have a lot of questions from last, not from last week, but from uh, that have been sent in in advance of this presentation. So we want to get to those first, and then we'll open it up to questions that people are submitting either by uh, raising their hand or in the Q&A uh, spot. But Eric, why don't we start with a couple of those questions and we'll try to answer as many as we can today. Yep. The first question submitted in advance, if a tenant has signed a mutual termination of lease agreement and is, is to vacate a unit, for example, on April 30th, and they fail to do so, do you know if a writ of recovery will be accepted by the courts on May 1st? Uh, first of all, the court doesn't accept a writ of recovery. That's something that the sheriff accepts. The writ of recovery is issued by the court to instruct the sheriff of the county that uh, this is taking place, that they are to remove the, uh, the renter. And so um, that will not be enforced at present right now uh, is the short answer to that. A writ of uh, execution to force a tenant out will not be uh, enforced by the sheriff, at least it shouldn't be. If a landlord tried to enforce one of those, the tenant would almost certainly call the attorney general's office, um, who is the agency that's tasked with enforcing the moratorium on evictions. And uh, it's, it's actually a misdemeanor to try to enforce an eviction right now. The next question, what legal, resource, what legal recourse is available to a landlord if a tenant is behind on rent and the lease ends during the state of emergency? Uh, not much until the state of the emergency ends. Um, a landlord's right to evict doesn't simply go away because we're in a peacetime emergency. It just gets paused at this point. Uh, so let's say the peacetime emergency ends in mid-May and the landlord wants to go file an eviction the day they're eligible to do so for non-payment of rent. They could certainly do that at that point. You wouldn't have to uh, wait until June 1st, for instance, to make sure, or June 2nd, I should say, where June's rent hasn't been paid on time. You'd say, hey, look, May's rent wasn't paid, April's rent wasn't paid, so I wanna file an eviction because now I'm, I'm eligible for filing this, uh, and so I wanna file it as soon as I can. Uh, the landlord would have the right to file it at that point. Uh, question about uh, if it's possible to attain a rental license in Minneapolis. Uh, I don't know why it wouldn't be possible to obtain a rental license in Minneapolis. You'd have to go through the city. Uh, rental licenses are all city created um, licenses. There's no state rental license or county rental license. So uh, I would check with the city and find out what uh, they're requiring and if there's any extra requirements in the COVID-19 era. But uh, I don't know why a landlord couldn't get a rental license right now. The, there was Mi Minneapolis inspection staff on our call last on one of our calls last uh, one of our webinars last week, and they did say they're up in operation. And for the most part, um, they didn't answer the question about rental licenses. I assume they, that's something they can do, but they're doing a lot of inspections virtually, and uh, I believe they've, for the most part, shut down annual rental inspections. So it's just complaint based at this point. That's just for Minneapolis. Next question. Uh, how do you how do you, how exactly to handle a lease signed pre-COVID, but but now cannot force renters, current renters, to leave? Got it. Uh, yeah, this is something that we're going to see tomorrow, uh, and we're going to see probably a lot of it. Uh, so we have the current tenant that is in the place on April 30th that was supposed to leave by April 30th, that doesn't leave by April 30th, and the landlord has uh, either the tenant gave a notice to vacate or the landlord gave the tenant a non-renewal or a notice to vacate and the tenant refuses to go on May 1st. Uh, the landlord might have arranged for a new tenant to move in on May 1st. Um, 
the landlord doesn't have a lot of options to force that current tenant out, not right now. In fact, they wouldn't have had great options pre-COVID-19 in that situation because the only real remedy a landlord has at that point is to file the eviction. Uh, right now, that can't be filed, not for that purpose. Uh, and so it delays what the landlord could do. But even pre-COVID-19, it would take, if the landlord wouldn't file the eviction, a standard eviction in Minnesota takes 20 to 30 days on average to remove a tenant. And so uh, it wouldn't really solve the landlord's problem. The only real weight that eviction, I guess, threat would have on May 1st normally for a landlord would be, hey, hey tenant, current tenant, if you don't go, I can go file an eviction against you. Uh, and so unless you want an eviction on your record, uh, you're going to leave. Uh, but now that ability to file the case right away uh, is not allowed for a landlord because of the moratorium on evictions. Um, what I'm trying to get tenants that are current tenants that are planning to stay uh, do on our tenant hotline is we're trying to tell them to at least tell the landlord that this is what's going on, that they've been looking for another place but couldn't find one or because they've lost their job, they no longer qualify for the next place. Uh, to at least tell the landlord because there are going to be a lot of May 1st mover enters that we're planning. They have the moving truck. They're ready to move in that, who knows, might be able to find a place in a couple of hours today if they knew they needed to find another place. Um, I do think that the landlord has a claim against the current tenant who sticks around for uh, damages that they suffer because of this. If they lose that next tenant because they couldn't move in on May 1st, they could, and it sits empty for a month or two uh, beyond when the current tenant is there, uh, I think the landlord probably has a claim for some rent if, the, if they've lost rent. If the uh, prospective tenant that was supposed to move in uh, sues the landlord for uh, hotel charges because they had to have a hotel for a couple nights and maybe extra nights of having the moving truck, um, I think that the landlord would have an argument to pass those costs on to the current tenant uh, who's uh, actions uh, basically led to the landlord's loss of uh, income or uh, damages that the landlord suffered. So I, I'm sure that there's going to be plenty of litigation that happens about those types of issues. Uh, it'll always get minimized by that next tenant finding another place as soon as possible. So, uh, but, but it's, it's pretty late in the game right now for a tenant to say, hey, I'm not going to be moving out May 1st, so I hope you didn't have anybody else renting the place. Uh, but I, I know we're going to see a lot of that tomorrow. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for everybody involved, for the current tenant, for the landlord, and for the prospective tenant. Uh, this is somewhat related. We're not renewing a lease. No rent since before COVID-19. Lease ends at end of May. Should, should they send a 30-day notice? So this is actually a really complicated legal question. Um, and uh, I'm going to give the answer that lawyers always hate to give, which is I don't know what will happen with that. Uh, there's an argument that a notice to vacate or a non-renewal given right now for any time after the peacetime emergency ends is violating the governor's order, which doesn't just ban evictions, but there's a moratorium on terminating the tenancy uh, from the landlord's side. So is a landlord saying, I'm not going to let you stay past the end of May today, violating the governor's order? Reading the governor's order, which you're all welcome to look up on your own. It's executive order 20-14. It's really easy to find online if you want. Uh, is my best guess, I think that is a termination of the tenancy. But like so many of the things that we're dealing with in the law right now, we don't know how they will play out in a COVID-19 world. Uh, there's no precedence for us to look at to see what executive orders mean when it comes to a termination of a tenancy. And that's what lawyers almost always couch their answers in, is relying on things that have happened before, the precedent. And since we don't have any precedent that really answers it, and the governor's order doesn't explicitly state the answer to that question, we don't know if that is a violation of the governor's order. From what I understand, the attorney general's office has not tried to enforce that part of the statute against any landlord that gave a future notice to vacate or a future non-renewal. but. Uh, Reading the governor's order literally, I think they could. You see that bottom question there? I'm sorry, you're asking me? Yeah. 
uh, are we jumping ahead or are we staying with the ones that well, we're Well, this one is related to this question. So. Oh, I'm okay. I'll, I'll get to it then. So in response to the question you're answering right now, a different response was given on the recorded session previously made. The 30-day notice was said to be okay long as it was after the date of the current order. Um, you know what? I don't have the tape in front of me. Uh, and so it's, it's, if that's what I said last week, uh, I guess that highlights the uncertainty of the situation. But I think I've been uh, consistent on that view, uh, which is that I think that a notice to vacate given now for the end of May, if the governor renews or it doesn't renew the uh, eviction moratorium or the termination of tenancy moratorium, uh, I believe that that has a chance of violating the order. Again, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, you certainly can't say it with certainty. I don't think anybody on either side could say that, whether it's a landlord lawyer or a tenant lawyer. And uh, another submitted in advance question: During the pandemic, um, under the under the Executive Order twenty fourteen, evictions are still allowed for drugs, including marijuana. How would a landlord know if a tenant potentially has a medical permit? Can we ask for proof during the the pandemic order, and also? when this order expires and things go back to normal? Uh, so a landlord can currently, have, and I think there's another question that's built into the, I looked at all the questions beforehand and I don't have a list in front of me. Um, it doesn't work the way I have my computer set up. But uh, uh, we had another question about marijuana where somebody had asked whether marijuana was something a landlord could evict for. Yeah, a landlord can evict for the marijuana uh, if it's violating the controlled substances rule in Minnesota. Uh, and they could evict for it now. Uh, it's one of the few things that a landlord could evict for. Um, marijuana is on the controlled substances list still in Minnesota, so a landlord can file an eviction for that. The medical marijuana gets really complicated really fast. If somebody uh, has the proper documentation, the argument becomes a lot more difficult uh, for a landlord to win. But it's, as I understand it, and this, we haven't done any cases on this, it's not in the smokable format that the medical marijuana is prescribed. And so smoked marijuana, which is almost every marijuana case I've ever seen in Minnesota, uh, would still fall into the controlled substances. So that, that's everything that was submitted in advance. Okay. And I know we have leftover questions from last week, but why don't we go to the ones that we've gotten today uh, and again, I would love to hear from people that are willing to raise their hand and um, maybe uh, even show their face. I've been, I, I did one of these yesterday and I did two of them last week. So I've been looking at myself on the screen a lot. And I don't know if you've ever done that, but it's not that fun. Love to hear from somebody else in person if they're willing to ask a question by raising their hand. But I see that we have a question from Kimberly Wood uh, right now. And we'll start with that. Can we enforce a notice to quit? if the crime-free addendum was broken and terminate a lease immediately as we normally can. So the crime-free addendum is something that a lot of cities require landlords to have in their leases. Um, there's no state law that requires it, but there are city licensing requirements that require landlords to have them. Um, and uh, a violation under the strict letter of a crime-free addendum might not be enough to win an eviction for either seriously endangering, uh, which is one of the standards a landlord has to get to right now, seriously endangering other tenants or violating the drugs, illegal guns, um, prostitution or possession of stolen property rule. That's the extent of what a landlord can file an eviction for right now today. Uh, a literal uh, violation of the crime-free addendum is something that on its face is not enough to file an eviction for right now under the governor's order. It would probably be seen as a standard breach of the lease. I mean, it's simply in addition to a landlord's lease, the crime free addendum is. And so any typical breaches of the lease are not sufficient for a landlord to file an eviction right now under the governor's order. And as long as the peacetime emergency uh, remains in place. All right, uh, next question is from Mary. And this kind of gets back to what we were talking about uh, earlier, where the landlord is giving a notice to vacate today, for instance, or a non-renewal notice for the end of May or for the end of June, for instance. Uh, and her question is, if uh, they have to give one now, I'm sorry, I guess you can't see it, so I'll just read it first. 
Under the governor's order, can a landlord even give a notice to vacate until the order is lifted? If they give one now, do they have to reissue a new one when the order is lifted? Uh, again, uh, Mary, uh, we're not sure. We're not sure exactly what would happen in that situation. Uh, keep in mind that the governor's order isn't the only uh, question that we have to answer when it comes to an eviction being filed right now. There's also the CARES Act, which is the federal prohibition. Uh, it only applies to non-payment of rent evictions. This would be uh, if you gave a non-renewal or a notice to vacate, that would not be a non-payment of rent eviction. It would be what we call a holding over eviction. If, for instance, you told the tenant to leave by May 31st and they didn't and they were still there by June 1st, the eviction that you'd file, the unlawful detainer or UD, would be filed for holding over. And so it wouldn't fit into the CARES Act, but the governor's moratorium does still apply. So then your question, do we have to give a new notice once the governor's moratorium has been lifted? Uh, it would depend on what a court does with the first case that comes in front of them asking this question. Can a future non-renewal be issued or notice to vacate be issued by the landlord or was that a violation of the governor's executive order to terminate the tenancy uh, d during the governor's moratorium on evictions under their executive order. And so until we see a case where a court decides that question, we're really just uh, guessing at this point about what, what would happen if that is heard. Okay, next up, uh, uh, Janae uh, is asking, does a landlord in Minneapolis have a legal right to rent out their garage for storage purposes to a tenant that is not the renter of the property? Okay, does a landlord in Minneapolis have a legal right to rent out their garage for storage purposes to a tenant that is not the renter of the property? Um, to start, I do residential landlord tenant law here. That's what our office does. We, again, if those of you that watched last week know, and anybody that knows our office knows that we uh, advise only tenants. We don't advise landlords. The only kind of landlord even remotely close to advice, although this isn't legal advice today, it's just kind of a general forum that we're talking about here. Um, but even if this were a tenant asking me this question, I'm not sure that I'd be able to answer it. There's a whole separate set of rules for storage lockers. Uh, obviously, that's become a massive industry in the last 20 years in this country that didn't used to exist on anywhere near the level that it does now. And there are all kinds of regulations about what can be done with storage lockers. Uh, and so that's where I'd have to tell you to look is under the storage locker rules uh, there are state laws, there might even be city rules about storage lockers and what a landlord or the owner of the storage locker is allowed to do and not to do. But it's, it's a little bit beyond my area of expertise, I apologize, but uh, we have a limit to the stuff that we really know. Okay, and I noticed that we have uh, two questions in the queue right now. So if you do have a question, this is why we're here today. We're trying to answer the questions that you have um, and I'll get to these two questions in a second, but if you have a question and you're thinking, oh, if I submit one, nobody's gonna bother to answer it. Hey, you know what, we've, we've got a open space. We can take questions from last week as well that we didn't get to, but uh, happy to hear your questions if you have them. Next question though, comes from an anonymous attendee. Are there any squatter rights we should be aware of? Uh, again, and this is a question we got last week. Uh, we got questions about squatters and trespassers. Um, squatter rights don't really exist in Minnesota that we've heard about in uh, other settings, like if you've seen TV shows about people in New York or uh, San Francisco, squatters rights don't really have the same sort of um, official embrace that they, they do in those places apparently. I mean, I've, I'm not licensed in New York or in California, so I don't know exactly what happens just from what I've seen on TV shows as well. but. Uh, Normally, a, a tenant is, is actually defined in Minnesota law. So a tenant, just to, to know sort of the baseline requirement for establishing the rights of a tenant and the rights of a landlord, is that rent is due. So I've, I've heard squatters referred to by landlords many times over my career. I've been doing this since 1996 and I've talked to about 200 groups of landlords. And when a landlord says, what are squatters rights? Uh, I ask for more details. What do you mean by a squatter? Well, somebody that isn't paying their rent anymore. Um, they, they owe their rent, but they haven't been paying their rent, so they're squatting. Well, you know what? If they owe rent, they're not a squatter. They have the rights of a tenant, and right now that means that you can't evict them. 
Now that's not to be confused with somebody who breaks in, literally breaks into a place and takes possession illegally. That would be a trespasser. And you could certainly ask the police to remove the trespasser. Uh, that's what you're allowed to do. Uh, they didn't take possession legally. And so they have no rights as a tenant. There are some in-between sort of uh, statuses that are possible. One would be something called a licensee. Um, that's, again, somebody that never took possession illegally that you, the owner, gave possession to uh, at some point. And uh, that, that's a little trickier legally. There, there was only one case that I'm aware of where a licensee was really discussed on how removing one of them would work. And, and the court sort of hinted that a two-week notice might be enough or maybe a month's notice. It was actually a lab uh, at the University of Minnesota that somebody had set up a lab and they'd been working there for years and they had the right to be there. But then the, the program got shelved or something like that and the university removed all the lab equipment. And the licensee was really upset that their work had been lost because the work was in, in mid-experiment or something like that. Uh, and the court said, ah, you should have given some notice. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got these basic versions of uh, identifiers or labels that we use for people that are occupying space. If somebody owes rent, they're a tenant. If they broke in illegally, they are a trespasser. Uh, all right, let's move on to, um, sorry, I just lost part of my screen there. If you are not renewing, this is anonymous again, if you are not renewing a lease, and uh, 2014, that's the executive order from the governor banning uh, evictions, continues, when do you give notice? And if they stay, how many times do you give continued notice if they stick around? Okay, so I'm assuming that this is going to be like most leases that we see in Minnesota, which is probably the tenant moved in originally and it was a one-year lease, or maybe they moved in month to month. Uh, but the year is either over or the tenant is still month to month. Uh, if that's the situation, then the landlord could wait until the stay on uh, evictions or the moratorium on evictions and tenancy terminations is over, has expired officially, whenever that occurs, and then give a notice then for the end of the next rental period, for instance, if it's a pure month to month tenancy. Um, I realize that takes some patience and maybe that, let's say the governor keeps extending it again and again and then we end up in the winter and the landlord is thinking, well, I don't want to give somebody a notice to vacate for the winter because it's really hard for me to re-rent then. That's legal. Uh, it, but a landlord could wait until the spring. They could say, you know what, I'm going to give my notice effective for the end of March and I'm going to give it to the tenant here in December so they have a little more time to plan, but I, I am going to give a notice. Uh, I don't think a landlord waives the right to uh, give a notice to vacate or a non-renewal by not doing one. It's not like the lease will automatically become a one-year lease. Um, I think there used to be a lot more leases like that, but that would have been uh, honestly well before my time. I started in 96, and in the 70s, I've read about leases where renewals would be for a year automatically, but those don't happen much anymore. Um, so I'd be really surprised to see that in a modern lease. Uh, next up, uh, Mary with another question. What rights do tenants have if the landlord comes or sends people for repairs with the COVID rules in place, especially if the tenant has health issues that put them at risk for the virus? Okay, uh, so this is something we're getting uh, just an awful lot of calls about in our office now. Again, we run a tenant hotline where we take about 15,000 calls a year. And uh, so tenants are asking about this question a lot right now. So I, I sort of separate when the landlord is using their key into two categories, especially right now. The first is repairs. If the tenant asks for repairs to be made and the landlord wants to come in and make the repairs and the tenant is fine with the landlord coming in, there's no issue. It's just a matter of trying to figure out the logistics of trying to social distance and, and sanitize everything before and after the landlord or their agent uh, comes in. The harder question is if the landlord wants to make a repair that the tenant doesn't want made right now. They just don't think it's urgent. Or the more common issue that we're running into right now is the showing issue. And so that's what I'm gonna focus on here is the showing question. So the tenant is given a notice to vacate. They're planning to move. Let's say they wanna move the end of May, a really common end of the month that tenants wanna move because it's warm and it's easier to move then than the end of January. So a lot of people are gonna be moving at the end of May. The landlord wants to show the rental to the prospective next tenant. 
This is very common. This is how it's been done forever. Landlords want to show the place to the next tenant. In fact, uh, we've written a couple of books, one for landlords, one for tenants. And one of the things that we said in the tenant book was you should never rent a place uh, without seeing it in person first. Um, so I am on record saying that. I remember saying it. It's written down, no question about it. Uh, and the problem with that advice right now is I'm just not sure how wise that is to do, to see a place in person. Now, if the place is empty, if the rental is empty and a prospective tenant is looking for a place, I think going and insisting on seeing the place, okay, fine. The landlord can probably figure out a way to make that safe for everybody. But if the current tenant is there uh, and they don't want the showing to happen, this gets hard because under the law, the landlord is allowed to come in if two things occur. First, the landlord has to have a reasonable business purpose for entering. Second, the landlord has to try to give reasonable notice. So this statute has been around since the mid 90s, a little before I started. And it talks about these two prongs that are required, reasonable business purpose and reasonable notice. Uh, but uh, another part of this same paragraph where it talks about when a landlord can enter says, under the circumstances, uh, under the circumstances, which is a phrase that we never really focused on until about six weeks ago, because the circumstances, as we all know, have changed dramatically everywhere. So it's a fair question to ask right now, is it reasonable under the circumstances for a landlord to be able to insist upon entering for a showing uh, in the COVID-19 era? It, there's a decent argument for a tenant to make that the landlord shouldn't be able to insist on coming in and, and be able to come in regardless of whether the landlord says yes or no to the landlord entering. Uh, and if the tenant refuses to let the landlord in, what's the landlord's remedy right now? Well, like most cases and most breaches of the lease, if this is a breach, they could go file an eviction. But right now they can't. They can't file an eviction. So tenants have uh, quite a bit more leverage when it comes to letting the landlord in for showings. Now, I have told tenants for years that, uh, and this is something I've written in, in, in both books again, that if a tenant really wants their security deposit to be returned in full, if that's one of their goals, um, one of the ways to maximize their chances of making that happen is to help re-rent the place. Uh, if some new tenant moves in on June 1st and the current tenant leaves on May 31st, their odds of getting their deposit back go up substantially because the landlord simply doesn't have that much time to find things that might be wrong. They've got to turn the place over quickly, maybe in a matter of hours. Uh, and so uh, security deposits tend to come back to tenants more. I mean, if I'm, if I'm sort of predicting who's going to get a deposit back and you say that the place sat empty for a month or two after they left or they refilled it the day after the tenant left, I'm always going to say, well, the one that got filled the next day is much more likely to get the deposit back. Why I'm saying all this is because the current tenant has a real interest in the landlord re-renting the place. It might not be obvious and it's not something you can just see when you look at the rules, but that's just the practical effect of landlords being able to re-rent. So, a current tenant has a stake in the landlord re-renting. So what we're seeing a lot of tenants do when it comes to the showing issue is they're helping the landlord with virtual tours. Uh, they're cleaning their place up really well. You know, maybe they've already started to pack uh, a lot, but they'll, they'll take a picture of an area that they've cleaned out and then they'll move all the boxes that they have to that area where they've already taken the picture and then they'll clean the next area so they can get everything photographed really well. So it shows really well in a virtual setting. Uh, and then the landlord is able to do an effective virtual tour of the place for the prospective next tenant. And if there is going to be a showing, regardless of uh, whether the tenant wants one or not, the current tenant wants, wants one or not, a landlord, uh, I think, owes it to that current tenant and to the next tenant, the prospective tenant, their, their potential customer, to uh, do everything they can to make sure everybody's safe. Um, so encourage the current tenant to have all the lights on. So nobody has to touch the light switches. All the doors should be open, the closet, the bathroom, everything should be opened up. So nobody has to touch those. Uh, and then uh, have gloves for both the landlord or the agent, along with the prospective applicants uh, and masks. Uh, I think that's sort of gonna be a, an expected uh, thing going forward, and maybe it'll be part of a, a governor's order at some point that any kind of interaction like that requires uh, gloves and a mask. I know the realtors are selling the fact that they're doing this right now. 
uh, and I think landlords probably could sell that back too. Hey, safety matters to us. You're our current customer. We care about you. We also care about our next customer. So safety first for everybody. And I think it's actually part of a sales pitch a landlord could use when they're doing a showing to try to convince that next tenant that uh, they should rent from that landlord. Okay, uh, on to a question from Diane. A friend owns a duplex that is occupied by one legal tenant and one illegal sublet. Illegal sublet has been reported to be smoking pot in the unit. Cops will not enter to inspect. How can they evict? Yeah, it's a fair question, Diane. Um, look, this is one of those things that landlords will say uh, somewhat regularly, hey, they're smoking marijuana in the apartment. So I'm gonna go file an eviction against them for smoking any marijuana in the apartment. And if they do file that eviction, they're gonna find out what every landlord that files an eviction for any kind of breach, whether it's uh, something like that, where it's the, the, the drugs, the illegal guns uh, statute or a breach in their lease, which is they have to prove it. They have to be able to prove that there's marijuana in the apartment. The cases that tend to win for landlords are when the police have entered, and typically they will dump the contents of an ashtray if they see one into a bag, take it with them, run it through a lab, and confirm that there was marijuana. Those are the cases where landlords win, uh, that type of case, where you're actually filing the eviction for uh, marijuana being in the home. Anything short of that, and it starts to get harder and harder to win. Uh, this was, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, but our office had a case where we were involved and uh, a tenant had turned out to have a bag of uh, what looked like marijuana. We saw the photos and it sure looked like exactly what it was, but it turned out to be a bag of uh, oregano, dried oregano. And uh, the landlord, of course, lost the case. Uh, proving uh, marijuana is in the place is a much different question versus uh, I think there's marijuana in the place. So without a, a police, a firm police report with some evidence um, from a trained observer, uh, I, I just don't like the case from a landlord's perspective and would be really gun shy about filing that kind of eviction. Um, and if I were a landlord lawyer, I'd be telling the landlord the same thing. We can't guarantee a success if we go to court with this. Um, so just so you're aware that there's that giant hurdle to get past. Another question, have you seen landlords trying to raise rent at this time, raising it by a lot? I understand the AG's office is looking into price gouging, which can be rent increases too, I think. Yeah, so we didn't talk about the price gouging order. It's yet another executive order from the governor, which uh, does include housing. It's specifically listed as one of the items where price gouging can't occur. Uh, the governor's order named 20% as the automatic number where price gouging would be sort of presumed. But it doesn't have to arise to 20%. Uh, there's there's a, a much vaguer standard that the Attorney General's office, again, the office tasked with enforcing this rule, can look at to see, is this uh, you know wildly out of proportion for the other comparable products in the area, which I guess would be other you know two bedroom apartments in the same neighborhood. I suppose they'd have to try to figure it out. Real estate in general is considered to be a really um, unique item. Every piece of real estate in the law is seen as different than everything else. Even if you're on the same floor of the same building, it's got a slightly different view. Even if it's got the same floor plan, there's slight variations. And so uh, I'm not exactly sure how that would play out, but uh, we, we aren't seeing uh, uh, a massive influx of price gouging calls on our hotline. Um, we've actually seen, I think, if I had to guess, maybe more rent decreases than increases from landlords. Um, I'm not sure what the market is going to look like uh, once this all settles out. I'm not sure what the market's going to look like next month um, as far as who's paying their rent and, and things like that. But landlords that are getting paid by tenants are increasingly viewing those paying tenants as ultra valuable. And so if they have a lease that's about to come up for renewal, the landlord seems to be thinking, I want to do what I can to save that tenancy and keep that good paying tenant here. So I'm going to make sure they don't leave. And if that means I keep the rent the same when I planned on increasing the rent, or even if I knock 10 bucks off the rent, you know, on a $1,300 a month place, that might be enough to keep that good paying tenant right now. So we're actually seeing some rent decreases in my mind more than increases. All right, new, uh, new questioner here. Michelle is asking, uh, let's say a resident reports that they have COVID-19. 
Two weeks later, the resident needs a repair done in their apartment. Can we require a doctor's note that the resident no longer has COVID-19? Okay, so obviously this is not a planned question. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate you asking, Michelle. It's a careful, carefully thought through question right now, and it's important, but nothing I've planned an answer for. Um, I'm trying to think what a judge might do with this if this were in court, frankly. And that's how lawyers view most things that, that they are first confronted with. Um, I'll mention uh, another piece of the, the moratoriums that are out there right now, which is a tenant's normal remedy for a landlord failing to make a repair currently isn't available either. So landlords can't file evictions. Right now, a tenant can't file a rent escrow, which is the number one recourse for tenants to take when it comes to any kind of repair issue. Now, that does not apply to emergency repair issues. If there's not a working toilet or the running water or no hot water uh, or other essential services or facilities, there's kind of a catch-all phrase in the ETRA, Emergency Tenant Remedies Action Statute. But rent escrow is a tenant couldn't file one right now. And I'm, I'm answering it this way because it's almost a moot question if the tenant can't file the rent escrow today. Um, I, I certainly don't see... Uh, I, I can understand the landlord's concern about sending anybody in if they know that an occupant has COVID-19. Um, and I think there's a sort of a weighing of the costs and the benefits here. Tenant, what exactly is the issue you've got, right? Is it something that has to be done right now? Or is it a cosmetic-ish thing? Or is it something that can wait until you're cleared of the virus and everybody feels safer about all of this? Um, but right now, a tenant couldn't even file the rent escrow. I suppose, just thinking this through a little bit more, that if you refused to make the repair and it was something that they thought was necessary and you actually said, I'm not making the repair because of your COVID-19 status, um, the tenant might decide that they wanna try to file a claim with the Department of Human Rights on that, saying, hey, you're discriminating against me for a disability or at least a perceived disability. Um, again, this is really top of my head stuff because we haven't had that question before. Um, but that's a possibility, sort of thinking about the potential ramifications of that situation. We got, so, Mike, we got I, one. We, we, yeah, we have one question left there. and We have a couple in the chat area as well. Yep. Is that what you have? Yeah, I was just going to mention the chat. And then Thank we've you. also got a hand raised. Oh, let's go to the hand raise. I'd love to hear from somebody else, and we'll get to the other questions. I'm sure we'll have time. Okay. Uh, I think, Christine, you should be able to talk right now. It says you're muted. Oh, there, yep. Thanks. Um, I wanted to add to that question about maintenance and see if we are allowed to require our tenants to leave the building when we send maintenance in, if it is a necessary repair. So, Christine, I'm sorry, did, did you ask if you were um, requiring the tenants to go when you make the repair? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I'm asking if we can require them to leave the building when we send our maintenance in to do the repair. Trying to think of all the sort of conflicting laws that are built into your question there, Christine, and it's a solid question. Again, everybody's trying to figure out the safe way to do things right now. Can you ask a tenant to go? I think that's an easy yes. Uh, you can ask a tenant, hey, you know what, we want to keep the social distancing to make the repair that you need done. And in order to do that, we'd like you to leave for that time. Um, it depends on the repair that you're talking about. If it's going to be a full day, I've seen landlords in the last week or two actually offering tenants uh, a gift card to a restaurant. Look, you know, we're going to need eight hours in there. We know it's you and your family and you won't be able to cook. And you can't really eat at restaurants, but you could at least pick something up at the drive-thru and go have a picnic in the park or something like that, and we'll cover the cost. Um, which sort of keeps, the, I guess, the conflict to a minimum at that point. If the customer, which is the tenant, is feeling like, okay, they got to come in to make the repair. But, you know, if it's going to take a long time and I'm not in my place, what am I supposed to do? But can you require them to vacate? Wow, that's a tough one. I'm not sure how you could require the tenant to vacate for making the repair. Um, I don't think that there's anything in the law that I can think of that would give you that unilateral power to force the tenant to vacate for a needed repair right now. 
Um, again, I think you can ask and you can try to give the tenant an incentive, but to force the tenant to go in that situation, I just don't think there's anything in the law that allows it. Thank you for the question though. Um, let's move on to Diane. We'll go back to that. And you, you're, Eric, you'll keep an eye out for other hands going up. If an owner finds evidence of marijuana during a maintenance call, can it be documented and would it give just cause to evict now? Uh, okay, so one of those questions we get uh, a lot from tenants is things like this, and they'll ask questions like, hey, the landlord didn't have a warrant, uh, is, a, is a phrase that we'll hear from a tenant when it comes to something like this. Landlords don't need warrants to enter. I mean, you're the owner of the property, you have the right to go in as long as you have a reasonable business purpose and you attempt to give reasonable notice. Um, and so uh, a landlord, in theory, yes, could file an eviction against the tenant for marijuana being discovered. Uh, if you really wanted a strong case though, once again, I would, I would say call the police and say, hey, look, I'm the landlord. I was in there checking on the furnace filter and I saw what looked like a giant uh, amount of marijuana, probably enough for resale or whatever level it would be at. And I don't know if you guys can get a warrant for that, but if you can, I'll be your witness. And then your proof level shoots up to a really hard case for the tenant to win versus uh, how do you know that was marijuana in the place, landlord? Um, you know, what kind of expert are you at marijuana to be able to assess with a quick visual scan that that's what you saw, which would be the, the defense that most tenants would try if you filed an eviction for that reason. Uh, all right. Um, looks like we got a question from Maria in the chat box. What advice are you giving residents to call to complain that their landlord isn't repairing items they want repaired, specifically speaking for non-urgent repairs? Right, so we're getting into that repair theme here. And just so we're clear, repairs in normal times are the top reason that tenants call a tenant hotline. Um, every year in every city, that is the number one reason people call us in Minnesota. And we cover the whole state, and so this isn't some exception to just one city. This is the top reason tenants call. But not right now. Uh, right now, it's uh, evictions because of non-payment rent that tenants are concerned about, and uh, when can the landlord come in? Those are the ones that are dominating our call volume most of the time, and sometimes tenants want to get out of their lease, maybe to move back home or, or something related to COVID-19. But on the repair front, if it's not an emergency issue, what we're telling tenants right now is uh, similar to advice that a landlord lawyer would be giving to a landlord. A landlord lawyer right now would tell their client, sorry, you can't file an eviction. On a non-emergency repair issue, what we're telling tenants right now is, sorry, you can't file a rent escrow. You can start the rent escrow process, and how the rent escrow process is started is by giving the landlord a what's called a 14-day letter. Landlord, here are the problems. Please fix them. Um, this, this letter has a bunch of different reasons. It's required under the rent escrow statute to start the case, but it's also sort of a common sense approach. How does a landlord know that something is supposed to be fixed unless the tenant can demonstrate that they told them clearly what needed to be fixed, which is why we require a written statement to start the rent escrow. Uh, and so that two week letter can certainly be given by a tenant now, uh, even though they can't file the rent escrow uh, during the present uh, court moratorium on uh, rent escrows. Eric, I don't see anything else lined up. I know we still have a lot of questions from last week that we can try to uh, wade through uh, if you wanna read some of those. But again, anybody who wants to get in with a current question for this week, we still have a little over 10 minutes to go we do and have, uh, are happy to answer what we can. We do have a hand raised. Oh, great, uh, let's see, let's hear it. We're gonna, one second, here's Mary. Okay. You're ready to go, Mary. You just have to unmute. I can try to unmute for you. Should be a red microphone in the lower corner of your portion there, Mary, and then you click on that. Um, I'm not able, I'm not, doesn't appear I'm able to unmute Mary. So um, okay. maybe maybe send in the question via the Q&A. Um, so yeah, one uh, question that came up last week, are tenants allowed to end their leases? Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that tenants are asking about this. Uh, let's say a tenant has a lease that goes through December um, or an even longer lease. Uh, sometimes people have two or three year leases. Those used to be very uncommon, but they're much more common now in the last five years than they were before. Uh, 
the law, nothing in, in the COVID-19 new era of rules allows a tenant to unilaterally break their lease early. There's simply no new rules on that. Now, can they go? Sure, they can, they can go, but they might owe the rent through the rest of their lease unless they can work out some sort of agreement with the landlord to uh, end the, uh, the contract. Now, and that happens quite a bit where tenants will buy their way out of the lease. They'll pay a break lease fee of one month or two months. Some leases even have the break lease fee stated. It's built into the contract uh, what it takes for the tenant to get out unilaterally if they wish to. Uh, and tenants get out of leases commonly. I mean, it's not all the time, but it, it happens a lot because life happens, right? People get a new job or they want to move to where their girlfriend or boyfriend is or, or whatever. Um, they want to go to school someplace else and they didn't realize they'd wanted to. And so it's negotiated frequently between landlords and tenants. Um, and it always is a negotiable thing between a landlord and a tenant, whether the tenant is allowed to break their lease early. All right, got a new question from uh, Diane. Given that the stay at home order has been extended till May 18th, when would it be safest to ask a tenant to vacate after lease has ended? Tenant is month to month now. Is 60 day notice a safe option? Okay, Diane, this is a easy uh, mistake to make with all the new rules we're dealing with. The stay at home order is not the same as the eviction moratorium. They're unrelated uh, items. Um, so the eviction moratorium is actually tied time-wise to the declaration of the peacetime emergency. That's where that's tied into. So that has a different time calendar schedule than the stay-at-home order, which has, uh, it might have been extended while we were uh, broadcasting this. Um, I think there was a two o'clock press conference and I, I read been, that it was. It's been announced, there. but it's been announced, but I, I'm not seeing that the executive order extending it is posted yet. So I see, but I, I read it was going to be two weeks as well uh, earlier today. Uh, and so um, they're not the same thing. So it doesn't really affect when you can give a notice to vacate. The only uh, prohibition on giving a notice to vacate is based on the eviction moratorium which again is tied to the declaration of the peacetime emergency. Um, and so uh, May 18th doesn't mean anything for that um, particular issue. It only means something for, oh, it looks like somebody's posting the two weeks more. Uh, thank you, Madeline, for uh, sending that along. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody could see that, but she posted a Star Tribune item. Okay, because of the social distancing, as a new question from Maria, can a landlord limit the amount of people, guests, in a unit at one time? Um, I think a landlord could certainly do this if their lease allows it. They could limit the number of guests that are there, but I don't see too many leases, much less than 1%, where a uh, landlord could limit guests unilaterally, uh, however they see fit. I think that as a landlord, if you want to try to enforce the social distancing rules and you know that the tenant is violating those by having people over, you could uh, call the police or whatever other enforcement mechanism is out there. I'm not even sure. I've, I've read about these things happening in other areas and I'm not sure if the police will take any action on this uh, right now unless there's another crime occurring in Minnesota. But if it's actually a violation of the governor's order in that regard, that would be the way to, uh, deter having large gatherings of guests is if the tenant is violating the social distancing rules, that might be a criminal violation there. Um, but it's not something a landlord could evict for. It's not on our list of things. Uh, I don't think it would fit under what the governor has issued. Uh, new question from Christine. Back to maintenance. We get a call. There is six, uh, is that inches or feet? I can never remember what the two inch, two dots are for. Uh, it must be six inches of sewage. Yes, six inches of sewage coming into the basement, but the tenant won't let us in the house to fix. Wow, uh, what is our recourse for this type of emergency? That is hard to believe that a tenant wouldn't let a landlord come in to deal with six inches of sewage uh, gathered in the basement. <sighs> I'm trying to think of the landlord's remedy here. Um, 
I suppose it depends a little bit on the building. I guess you could make the argument that you could file the eviction, that they're seriously endangering other tenants if there's more tenants in the building and you think that this is going to cause an immediate health hazard that can't be ignored and it's got to be fixed right away um, because that's that would get you the right to evict. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm try, I, I suppose you can always try to file some sort of uh, injunction at court uh, on an emergency level. That'd be complicated to do, um, but it's possible you could hire an attorney to try to file some sort of uh, emergency injunction to stop the tenant from blocking you from accessing the place to make sure that you can get in and fix something before the, the repairs become so bad that it, uh, you know, damages the house beyond repair or something like that. I guess that's a possibility. Um, but again, it's, it's the kind of thing where a tenant should be convincible on some level. Hey, there's a lot of sewage in the basement. We got to get in there and solve it or else, uh, I mean, COVID-19, we know it's, it's everywhere, but sewage being in your basement isn't healthy for anybody either. That's going to cause all kinds of health concerns quickly as well. Um, yikes. Uh, Sorry to hear about that. And I can tell you for sure that if a tenant were to call us about that, we'd be trying to talk them into letting a landlord in to fix that because that sounds like an emergency kind of issue. Uh, all right, Eric, uh, back to our previous questions with our remaining five minutes. Yeah, again, any, any more to go ahead and submit. Um, we had a question about last week and we did talk about this a little bit, but if your property isn't federally backed, but you have residents that uh, have section, a Section 8 voucher. Is the whole property considered covered under the CARES Act? Yeah, I think we got that question yesterday in the non-landlord uh, version. So the social worker and tenant version of this webinar. And you, you had answered that question. Do you mind taking that one again? Because I liked your answer yesterday. I thought it was- So, well so I believe there's conflicting um, information about this. Uh, the CARES Act appears, if you read it, um, that section, it appears that this would be true, um, but recently HUD issued guidance um, that says otherwise. So I think what that does is it creates uh, some of this confusion that um, has resulted in a number of states and, ju and local judicial districts, uh, not in Minnesota yet, but elsewhere, um, to actually require um, that before evictions are filed, uh, landlord will have to include an affidavit with the uh, with the filing that uh, where you're stating that your property does not that, that the unit does not uh, is not covered by the CARES Act, and then attaching evidence of that. Um, that's not the rule yet in Minnesota, but um, we have heard in multiple other states that that is what is happening. And that's of course, if you're trying to evict, if, if things open up in Minnesota before the timeline of the CARES Act, which is a suspension until July 25th, with a required notice, 30 day notice before a case, uh, an eviction can be filed for non-payment. Any other questions? Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're almost out of time. We've had a couple people very nicely uh, send us something saying, hey, thank you for hosting these. Um, sure, you know what, we want landlords to know what the rules are. That's all we're trying to do here. And we're happy that you are willing to give us an hour of your time to learn uh, as much as you can about what the rules are in this really complicated and ever-changing world. I mean, it's only been about six weeks since our state has really been um, just kind of, you know, immediately and substantially affected by the COVID-19 uh, virus. And we've had several changes in the rules since then. And we know more are coming. Our plan going forward is to do one of these a week, one, one on Wednesday for social workers and tenants, uh, and on Thursday for landlords as well. And if there are changes in the rules, our plan is to offer a quick update at the beginning. But then just like today, what we're trying to do is simply answer people's questions. Chances are, if you have a question, that there's going to be others uh, out there with a similar question. And so if you want to submit them in advance, as you noticed today, we try to put those at the front of the line. But uh, happy to talk to you and uh, try to answer these if we can. Uh, and again, uh, all of our, a lot of our materials um, 
are available on the link that I'm sending again. Um, the recordings of last week's webinars and this week's are there are there's links to them right there and and uh, within the day we will post the recording of, of today's seminar as well. With that, I'm seeing it's 2:30 and we don't have any any current questions, so I think we'll call it a day. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for participating and sending in your questions. And have a good day. Bye bye.